used to say that sometimes the sea just wants to be left alone. I always found it puzzling. Why not all the seas connected? Did they all feel the same way together? Or did they all have their own character? If every sea became angry at the same time, surely there would be no hope for any of us. Perhaps there are forces that control the seas, of which we are not aware. It is strange to think that one can be older than the ageless people of our childhood memories. Those that seem to have been here forever, who knew everything there is to know. To be older than a parent was when they died, leaves us strangely floating in time. Although, it was not death that took my Uncle Lars from us. Uncle Lars was one of the world's great idealists. If he had been born a thousand years ago, he would have been perfectly content and free to believe whatever he wanted. Torn between his obsession for what we could not prove, and the man of science that he was. Science that was his cornerstone, his love, his grounding, and on which, much to his dismay, he could not turn his back. I have never really supposed the two as being at odds with each other, only that we have not yet found this science. But then, I am not my Uncle Lars. When I told Lars the story of my hearing the singing on the coast, it was the kind of thing that would both excite and frustrate him. It was this incident that fueled his unshakable conviction in belief, almost being a science unto itself. that children could hear where grown-ups would not, that children could see where adults were blinded by their own disbelief. A child convinced they had seen a monster under the bed or a fairy in the garden. Have you ever heard an adult say, I must have imagined it, or my eyes must be playing tricks? Well, did you ever hear a child say that? Uncle Lars had believed me without a shadow of doubt. Although I am guilty of that same offence myself, that day that I heard the singing, which was not so much a song, but more the shadow or the sound of a song, a voice that the wind was blowing from far away. It was so clear to me, no shred of doubt that it was real, that I had not dreamt or imagined it, despite what my parents had later said. And yet, 
the further I come from that day over the years, I begin to doubt my own memory and conviction that it could have happened at all. My only evidence is the strength of my granny's reaction, who had brought me to the beach that day to look for shells. After a long time, I asked her where it was coming from, and only then we both realised that only I could hear it. She had believed me, there is no doubt of that. I remember the choking fear that I felt, to know that my best amour, always so reliable, was so upset that she became irrational. To lose my sense of safety, which a child does not question and is not aware of until it is gone. To be in the presence of a grown-up and to be suddenly aware of her frailty. I immediately collapsed into tears as I had no understanding of what I felt. The feeling that I had caused Bestemur to become frightened was something I will not forget. She took me by the arms then and wiped my face. Don't worry, she said. That is just the sea telling us to go home, and so we will do what she asks before she becomes angry. It will be all right. I had not been allowed to retrieve my sun hat from the end of the bay where I had played. Part of me yearns its loss to this day. Lars had always been my favourite grown-up. He always talked to me as though I were his equal. Though not just that, that I was grown-up. Except for his pet name for me, his Lille Hafruer, his little mermaid. He used to say to me, Lily, Lily you, you have, have salt, salt water, water in your veins and the blood of pirates in your heart. And such a bestowal brings responsibility on our part. My dearest little Lily, I hope my parcel finds you well, and most importantly, and like I always say, wiser than before. I know that you have loved this journal as much as I, though I wish that I could see it with your eyes. How I envy you, Lily, and your child's acceptance of everything as fact. Facts with endless possibility, without doubting or discounting. I find now that I cannot leave through it any more without hearing your endless questions ringing in the air. What language is this? Is it real gold? I wonder what she was called, and how each time I thought I gave you an answer, it would bring forth a deluge of twenty more unanswerable scenarios. Never let go of your curiosity, little one. Men greater than us have failed on letting that slip away from them. I told you that I'd been restoring Bestafar's old fishing boat, didn't I? Well, I am happy to report that it is done at last. The Nora is ready. A grand little seaworthy boat she is, and she will serve very well. Now, I am able to make my expedition. I have told Bestamore, and naturally she is not speaking to me again. But never mind, she will come around. You know how she gets. I know you'll look after her and be patient with her, for the sake of all that she has been through. And now I want to remind you of your great aunt Nora. I know Bestamore has told you the story of when she was a little girl and she and her sister heard singing on the water and what happened to Nora in that cave. Or at least only what we can suppose and what the doctors concluded. So it seems, after all, that I could not bring myself to give the journal to the historical museum as I intended. 
and I am so sure that the journal will be happier in your possession than it would be there, where nobody will be allowed to touch it and hear the waves amongst its pages the way you do. So as you can see, I enclose the Ocean Song Journal here for you. You will look after it, I know, and you never know Lily, perhaps you will see something one day that we both have missed. And now that you are the journal's guardian, you must know its story as far as I can tell it. Bestamore has told you about her sister Nora's accident. When you are older, no doubt she will let you read the few lines Nora wrote in her diary before she passed away. It is in the old metal case from Norge that Bestamore keeps under her bed. And the story, as much as I can continue it, is that the journal came from the same cave, but I can only make an educated guess at this. Bestemore does not know herself exactly where the accident happened as she was too afraid as a small child to go further. Nora went on alone to investigate the strange singing and she had passed out of sight by the time Bestemore heard her scream. We who came later will never know for sure, but Somehow, I believe that Nora's fate is tied up with the owner of the journal. And when I uncovered it as a young boy in those old abandoned smugglers' caves near Bestemore's house in Lafortin, I did not foresee that its mysteries would weigh on me all these years. I am reminded of what some of the old fishermen used to say down there on Lofoten coast when I started working on the boats with Bestafar. If the sea doesn't like you, she will make you sail round and round that coastline for days looking for the same place, till eventually you either go mad or get founded because the islands will keep changing. She will make them change shape and she will trick you so that nothing looks the same. That's why the pirates did so well down there years ago, all those tiny islands and coves. Who knows how many secret caves could be there. And so, the journal and I will part company. She will not travel with me. I fear her loss too much to risk losing her back to the sea, even though I do believe that the sea was her home for many years. The more I look at that painting, you know, the, the one that was always your favourite, the seahorse and the mermaid, the more what you said seems true to me. You said it looked so sad that she is saying goodbye, and I wonder again at your clarity, Lily. There is indeed some sadness tied up with this treasure, which is often the way with treasures, it occurs to me now. You, however, little mermaid, see things differently, and your love of its beauty will bring you joy. Don't show the journal to Bestemore. She does not know of its existence. I never told her that I had gone to that strange cave. It would frighten her, and having possession of such an enchanted object would no doubt cause her much distress. Her determination to return it to the waves would be so resolute that neither you or I could stop her. You used to berate me when you were very small, do you remember? But Uncle Lars, you don't believe in mermaids. Well, who can say, little one? I do not know, and I cannot lie, so I cannot say one way or the other. My vision is clouded by doubt and years of behaving like a grown-up. Oh, to have your clear sight and conviction, Lilihafru. 
It is my hope that one day I may accept things just as they are, like you do. And embrace the mystery as we do the mundane. I have to admit, Lily, that there are many things I cannot explain. And perhaps some things were put on this earth that defy explanation, that must exist in their own right, that would be demeaned by our imposing our primitive scientific boundaries upon them. And just as your forefathers respected the sea and all that lay beneath the surface, with acceptance and with a humility to know our place alongside it. I think that on some level this is all I am seeking. I hope you will remember me fondly, Lily, until we meet again. Always with love, Lars. Who can say whether it is a mermaid book? There are unexplained things in it, which was clear to Lars. As for the human things, as we used to call them, some of the maps and the photographs and the trinkets, I used to imagine she had collected them from the beaches, just as we do, or from shipwrecks under the ocean, or things that are tossed into the sea. I wonder still at what she was called, and whether Lars ever found his peace. <laughs>